I would like to begin by acknowledging that we gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascades watershed from time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Lummi Nation and Nooksack tribe, for their enduring care and protection of our lands and waterways. I am Abby Kaler, a teaching and learning librarian here at Western, and today I'm very excited uh, to welcome Dr. Merrill Peterson. Dr. Peterson is professor and chair of biology and insect collection curator at Western Washington University and the author of the recently published field guide, Pacific Northwest Insects. He is also an adjunct professor in the entomology department at Washington State University. A Seattle native, Dr. Peterson has been fascinated with the region's insects since his childhood. He received his BS from the University of Washington and his PhD from Cornell University. His research focuses on insect ecology, evolution, and diversity, and has resulted in numerous publications. Dr. Peterson has long been interested in macro photography, and his natural history photographs have been featured in the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, and many other places. Pacific Northwest Insects is the culmination of a decade-long labor of love in which he invested more than 10,000 hours. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peterson. Thanks, Abby, and thanks to all of you for, for coming today, especially on a lovely day like this. It um, means a lot to me that, that, that so many of you are interested in insects because, as Abby alluded to, I'm, I'm a lifelong insect freak, and, and I'm hoping to share some of that enthusiasm with, with you today. So, as Abby mentioned, this, this book is, it was really a labor of love that, that consumed me for much of the last decade or so, um, and, and so I'm hoping today to convey a little bit about why I would be so crazy as to spend that amount of time on, on a project like this, um, but also more broadly why I think a book like this is, is important, particularly in, in this day and age. Um, some of you may have seen some of the recent headlines, and I'll be featuring some of those uh, regarding insect demise, and, and so I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about that. So um, this is me sort of at, at the first stages of becoming an insect enthusiast. Um, I was almost literally knee-high to a grasshopper uh, when I first started noticing the insect world around me. Uh, I think part of this, as you can see, I'm, I'm pretty small there wearing wearing not only a Pooh Bear shirt, but also glasses. So I was nearsighted at an early age, and I think that might have played a role in my, my fascination with insects because they were at a scale uh, uh, that was approachable, and I could focus on them even before I had these high-tech things called glasses. Um, but apparently we would go to the zoo, and instead of looking at the lions and tigers and bears in their exhibits, uh, in their enclosures, I'd be looking at the bumblebees in the foreground, visiting the it's something that runs deep in me. I don't know why, but, but that's just how it, how it has always been for me. And so by the time I was uh, uh, in middle school, um, I had become deeply smitten with the region's insects. So I, I grew up in the, in the Seattle area, and this is me over in, near, in a canyon near Leavenworth one spring. I think I was 12 years old at the time, um, in pursuit of... of various butterflies that I'd read about that you could find in the canyons over there. So I'm, I've got my butterfly net in hand, and if you look down here, there's some butterflies on the mud, um, sipping, sipping fluids from the mud. And, um, so by that age, I had been given a book that was a, a, a thin little field guide on, on the northwest, uh, on, on the butterflies of Washington. Um, and probably by a, a year from then, I had learned all the Latin names of all of the butterflies in the state and was hell-bent on finding them all, um, sort of like a Pokemon before there was Pokemon. And then from there, I, I went on to, uh, to college at the UW, where I was fortunate to get involved in research in uh, several research labs in the, in the zoology department most of which were centered on Mount St. Helens. Uh, so this was, I'm dating myself here, this was not too long after the eruption in 1980. Um, 
where they were studying insect recolonization, among other things, in the Mount St. Helens blast zone. So I got to go down there with, with a couple, of, I'm, I'm in the middle there, with a couple of graduate students, um, sampling insects, setting up all sorts of experimental plots, and just having a great time immersing myself in, um, in ecological research and, and really starting to feel maybe less, less just naturalist and more scientist, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, I was start, starting to feel like, okay, I can see myself as a practicing biologist, and, and that inspired me then to go on to graduate school. And so it was really, I, I really credit my early mentors from, from that time, but also from, from before even, with showing me that there were these paths, um, and, and that made me want to come to a place like Western where I could then work with students and, and help them follow their paths of interest as well. So part of my interest with, with insects and part of the reason why a person can spend a lifetime studying insects and still feel like they have more to learn than they can, they can ever possibly learn in their lives uh, is because insects are so incredibly diverse. And, and part of the reason for this incredible diversity of insects is because they are a very ancient group. So this schematic here is a, a cartoon that kind of illustrates the, the relative diversity of insects compared to other major groups of organisms. So each major group of organisms is represented by one of these diagrams, one of these drawings. Uh, so here's the insect, obviously, and, and they're scaled to size so that th that's proportional to the number of species within each of those groups. So, the insects are dwarfing all of the others. Plants are here. Uh, mites are down here. Fungi are here. If you look for where the mammal is, it's this little tiny elephant right here. So compared to mammalian diversity, insect diversity is, is just vast. And if we're to put numbers to it, um, not only are they ancient, as I said, at least 400 million years old, but there are anywhere from five to 10 million species of, of insects in the world, of which we only know really a little over a million. Uh, so the rest are, we're sort of inferring based on rates of continuous discovery and areas that are unexplored and, and how many unique species tend to be found when we do exploration in these new areas. So it may be that as many as 90% of all animal species are insects. So because they are so diverse, and because they are so ancient, insects have also become integral to terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems around the world. And so they play numerous roles, and this is something that I think is important as we think about the, uh, the, the news about declining insects, because we need to think about, well, what are insects doing out there, and can we really afford for those services, those roles that they're playing to grind to a halt or slow down? So, for example, insects are incredibly important as pollinators, not only of wildflowers, but also of crops. And, and just to kind of put some, some numbers to that, um, the flowering plants are far and away the most diverse group of plants, and about 85% of flowering plant species depend on pollinators, the majority of which are, are insects. Um, if we think about crops and, and reliance of crops on, on insect pollinators, there are some numbers up there. 70% of the world's crops amounting to $180 billion a year in pollination services provided by, by insects. So this is non-trivial work that is being done by, by these insects that are out there, um, benefiting natural ecosystems as well as, as well as agricultural ecosystems. If we think about what the crops would be that we might lose if we didn't have insect pollinators out there, it's, it's a list that would make any foodie really sad to lose. So we've got coffee, chocolate, apples, raspberries, blueberries, almonds, cucumbers, avocados, the list goes on and on and on. And we simply wouldn't have these foods if we didn't have insect pollinators out there. Another important role that insects play in the world is, um, is that they are part of a lot of food chains, and as, as such, they can be powerful allies in our fights against pest organisms. So whether those pests are invasive plants, like the purple loosestrife down here growing near Portland, 
or aphids that might be eating the crops that we're trying to grow, we can employ, if you will, um, these biocontrol agents to help us in that process. And so in both of these cases, we have beetles as the actors of biocontrol. This is a beetle that was, was introduced to help control purple loosestrife. This is an introduced ladybug that helps uh, combat, um, combat aphids and other soft-bodied insects. Another role that insects play is waste processing. If, if you took away all of the dung beetles in the world, the, the poop would pile up deeper and deeper. Somebody's got to do it, and they're willing to do it. There are places in Australia where pastures become fouled because there aren't enough dung beetles, because the dung beetles have been declining, and, and so they'll actually import dung beetles to help process the waste and keep their pastures productive. Uh, the nutrients that are, are in the poop, as well as in dead animals, dead plants, get processed into the soil through breakdown that's done by these decomposing insects. And, and so they contribute to nutrient cycles that then ultimately free up those nutrients and then they're taken up by plants again. We also rely on insects a lot for various kinds of products. So some of the obvious ones are things like honey and silk but there are others that you might not think about necessarily. So the, one of the key ingredients in shellac is something called lac, which is derived from insects. And, and if you look at um, many red colored things like some lipsticks and various, various kinds of red dyed things, oftentimes you'll see carmine red as an ingredient and that's obtained from insects as well. So insect, in, insect products really kind of find their way into our lives in lots of surprising ways. And then, of course, insects are food for lots of other organisms that we are very interested in looking at. Um, so birds, for example, if you think about the bird watching industry and how much money is spent and how much time and how much joy comes to the world from bird watching, Many of those birds simply would not exist if they didn't have insects to feed on, either throughout their lives or at certain critical stages in their development. For example, even hummingbirds rely on, on having a supply of insects as protein when they're feeding their young. Uh, and you, if you took that away, they, you can't build baby hummingbirds off of nectar alone. <clears throat> Down here we've got the orcas. Orcas aren't big bug feeders, right? Or they feed on salmon in our waters. But salmon grow up in streams around here where they feed on invertebrates that are mostly stream insects that are growing up in, these, in the waterways around here. So if you took away the stream insects, you lose the salmon, and then you lose the orcas. And then down here, we've got a grizzly bear. You might be thinking, well, what, what does a grizzly bear have to do with insects? So in the Rocky Mountains, it turns out that grizzly bears don't rely on salmon as their primary source of food for fattening up. They rely on moths. So these grizzlies in late summer go up into the talus slopes, these rocky slopes above alpine meadows, and the alpine meadows are a late summer source of food for, for nectar, nectar feeding uh, moths that fly up from the lowland prairies to be able to continue to survive. And so in, in the daytime, these moths take shelter underneath the rocks by the thousands. And so these grizzlies, what they do is they work through the rock slides, flipping rocks over. And in a day, a single grizzly bear may eat as many as 40,000 moths. And over the course of a month, they put on about two thirds of their hibernation fat on this diet of moths. Freaky stuff. So E.O. Wilson, the famous uh, conservation biologist, uh, ant biologist, you name it, he's, he's done all sorts of things. Um, he has coined insects as the little things that run the world, which I think is a very, very apt phrase. And so I've mentioned that insects are super diverse. They do lots of really important things that we and the natural world rely on. And so that's all great, except for the fact that there have been some troubling signs of late. And, and I call this as sort of as, as a general phenomenon, the plight of the bumblebee. 
So around here, um, there is a bumblebee species that, that used to be really, really common. In fact, if you look at the WW Insect Collection and ask, well, what were the bumblebees that students were most often collecting when they were building their insect collections for entomology classes up through the 60s, 70s, 80s, into the mid-90s, it was this particular bumblebee species, the western bumblebee. As far as I know, a student hasn't collected a western bumblebee since 1995. So it went from being one of the most common to essentially gone from the landscape. They show up periodically here and there. A few years ago, somebody found one in a flower patch near Bothell, and it was newsworthy enough to make the Seattle Times. So uh, that shows you just how rare this species has become. As far as why it's become exceptionally rare, that's, that's a, a much harder question to answer, but there are a lot of potential culprits because we know that there are lots of reasons why insects have suffered in different kinds of settings. So if we think about what we have done to local landscapes as well as globally, there are many insults that we have thrown at the natural world. So we take large areas of formerly natural habitat and convert them to monocultures of crops. And in those crops, we often apply lots of fertilizers and we also spray them with pesticides, neither of which are ideal for the native organisms that would call that place home if this had never been, never been turned into a, a uh, a corn uh, a corn field. Down here what we have is extensive harvesting of forests, which obviously is a major disturbance to the habitat and, and uh, forest dwelling insects really don't tolerate this kind of change very well at all. And then we've got invasive species that are changing the, the composition, the floral and, and animal composition of natural communities so that these species essentially displace the native organisms. And then down here, this set of three pictures is, is really illustrative of the consequences of global climate change, where we have increases in the severity of fires and the frequency of those fires, increases in drought, and increases in the frequency of, of really big storms. And so all of these wreak havoc on natural populations of organisms. The net result is that it's not just here where things like the, the, the western bumblebee have, have declined, but we see, we're, we're starting to see evidence on a global scale of, of insect uh, problems. And, and some of those happen in natural ecosystems, some in managed ecosystems. To illustrate the latter, we can go to China where this is not an infrequent site now. So this person is up in a tree hand pollinating the tree because there aren't enough bees to do the work. So imagine doing that on, the, say, the scale of all of the orchards of the Wenatchee Valley, having people up there pollinating every blasted flower on the tree. Um, if we want our pears and, and other fruits like that, we might end up having to do that if we're not careful. But the news really started to accelerate around insect declines with the publication of a study that came out of Germany that was, uh, it, it was basically a, a group of citizen scientists who had done the same kind of insect sampling and surveying on this nature reserve in Germany for year after year after year, for 30 years. And they kept all the samples, and they, so they had just an amazing data set, the likes of which very, very few people have. And the startling thing that they found after they took all these data and looked at what was happening was they found a 76% decline in insect biomass over those, uh, flying insect biomass over those 30 years. So if we just think about the total mass of all of the insects flying around in the air over this nature reserve, a three quarters decline in that. And obviously there are going to be effects on other organisms that are feeding on those flying insects. So that was really troubling. And then this past fall, there was another even more troubling story that came out when similar research that was done in Puerto Rico was, was published. Um, so this was work where there had been some surveys that had been done again about 30 years ago and then repeated um, in around 2012, 20, 2010 to 2012 or something like that 
where they did the same sort of thing, sampling in all sorts of different ways, sticky traps, pitfall traps, window traps, net trapping, so exhaustively catching the insects in the area and quantifying them, in a place in this spot here, which looks like a beautiful tropical jungle. It doesn't look like the sort of place where you'd expect to see big insect declines. This is in an area where, in the surrounding landscape, the use of pesticide had diminished substantially uh, over the period of this study. So you wouldn't think pesticides would be causing increased problems or anything like that. And yet, despite the pristine look of this, of this forest reserve that had been actually set aside by the king of Spain, so that gives you an idea of the antiquity of, of this place, um, they, they found really dramatic declines. So, they found a 98% decrease in insects that were found on these sticky traps, so just like a piece of gluey paper. They found a 75 to 88% in, de in, in a decrease in captures by sweep nets. So no matter how you slice it, no matter how you quantify the insects, the forest went from a place that was really alive with insects to being one where you'd walk around and wonder, what happened here? Where is everything? And it wasn't just the insects that were suffering in this forest. They found that not only the insects had dropped, but also things that fed on insects had dropped. So um, the anoles, these lizards, uh, had decreased on average by 30%, and, and birds had decreased on average by 50%, but some had suffered even more. So this is a species of anole that, at the start of the study, was exceptionally abundant. There were a hundred or so of them per acre on average. When they went back for their follow-up study in 2010 or 12, it was gone. There wasn't a single one of these anoles. Down here is a, a cool little bird called the Puerto Rican toady, which is an insectivorous bird, so specializing on insects. Its numbers had declined by 90%. So trouble in paradise, uh, despite you know, what looks like a really nice kind of, of pristine forest. And then just about a week ago, there was another story that came out um, called The Worldwide Decline of the Entomofauna, a Review of Its Drivers. And this, this story, this, this paper in biological conservation got more splash than any of those previous studies, partly because it made some pretty fantastical claims. Um, but also because it did a really nice job of cobbling together all of these different stories about insect decline from, from various disparate studies. So the kinds of headlines that, that followed on the heels of that um, are pretty stark and, and dramatic here. An insect extinction could be upon us and the rest of the natural world will suffer the consequences. More, more than 40% of insect species declining, blah, blah, blah. So there's there are all those sort of, sort of uh, alarming titles. But to me, the, the even more um, flabbergasting thing as an entomologist is who picked up this story. So Newsweek, USA Today, Financial Times, these are not places that have a tradition of reporting about insects. So people are starting to notice that there is indeed a problem with, with um, insect declines on a large scale. So that paper, one of the things, as I said, it did was it pulled together all these different results from different studies, and it made some conclusions about what the major drivers of these declines have been. And so over here on the right are, are different Latin names for different groups of insects. So the, the blue here, Coleoptera, is beetles. This Hymenoptera is bees, wasps, ants, and, and their relatives. Lepidoptera is the butterflies and moths. Odonata is the dragonflies and damselflies. So those are the top four on each of these columns. And what you can see is that the big drivers are the things that I was just talking about a little bit ago. So we've got habitat change. We've got pollution. We've got various kinds of biological traits, including interactions with invasive species. And we've got climate change. So these seem to be the major culprits in affecting insects. And, and hopefully I've, I've convinced you from the early part of this talk that this is something that we should care about 
and that when we see the canary is moribund in the coal mine, that we really ought to be sweating it at this point, and we should be thinking about what can we do to make a difference and reverse these kinds of trends, not just locally, but, but globally. So that's where I'm hoping this book can actually make a contribution. Um, if we think about the last major successful environmental movement in this country, we really have to go all the way back to Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, which was um, sort of a, a key moment in the environmental movement uh, generally worldwide. But um, Rachel Carson's book called people's attention to the fact that widespread use of pesticides and, and uh, general uh, disregard for taking care of natural ecosystems uh, was leading to serious problems for birds. Uh, and, and that um, and she basically used this as a plea to our consciousness to, to, to try to take care, better care of the world ar around us. And it resonated. And I would argue that the reason why this resonated was not because people were just ready to fight against pesticides, but it was because they already cared about birds. And I would argue that the reason why they already cared about birds was because birds were already accessible to them. They could, people could know what the birds were around them, and the reason why they could know what the birds were around them is because of field guides. So field guides, I think, are an incredibly important way of connecting people with nature. And you know, if you think about it as a naive person being plopped in a new country without a field would be a real challenge. And so guides like P Roger Torrey Peterson's, no relation, field guide to the birds um, were, were tickets for people to access this, this amazing knowledge about the world of birds around them and to start to make connections with, recognize the species that come and go seasonally, and, and really develop um, affection toward the birds in their world. My hope is that the same sort of thing happens with insects, given that insects are clearly in trouble and we need people to care more about them. Um, a challenge with insects, though, is that, as I said, they are exceptionally diverse. So if we think about the problem, the, the difficulty in, in learning the birds of an area, we'll just think about now how much harder it's going to be if we've got a group as diverse as the insects. So if we've got all this different kinds of, of insect form and function that's illustrated by this pie chart here, and we just zoom in on one part of it, we'll zoom in on the beetles here, there's an incredible amount of diversity in the beetle world alone. Even if we zoom in further on one aspect of beetle diversity, the numbers of species can be pretty jaw-dropping. So here are a bunch of ladybugs. This is about 10% of the Pacific Northwest ladybug species. A lot of people think, oh, there's just one or two, right? Um, there are something like 150 different uh, ladybug species in the Northwest. So now if you kind of zoom back out then and think, well, if we're going to try to get people to care about the ladybugs and uh, the longhorn beetles and the scarab beetles and the toothneck beetles and all these different kind of beetles and then step out further and, and get them to care about various groups of stoneflies and caddisflies and wasps, it's a tall order to try to connect them with that diversity. And so that was the problem that I was trying to grapple with in, in thinking about how to produce this field guide. Another challenge with passing this sort of information on to people is that if you look at the world of insect taxonomic experts, it tends to look like this. A lot of gray hair. And this isn't because it's just old people that like insects. I mean, you saw that picture of me. I was not 
four going on 80. I was four. Um, one of the reasons why this has happened is because curricula at universities all around the world have changed over time. And they've changed over time in part because new areas of biology become interesting and fascinating and, and funding streams follow the new interesting and fascinating and we forget about the importance of some of the, 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 the foundations of the science. And natural history is an important foundation of biology and understanding taxonomic diversity is an important foundation of biology and yet it's getting harder and harder to find courses in entomology, general entomology. Um, they just recently canceled the one done at the University of Washington. So as far as I know, mine is the only one that's regularly taught in Western Washington as an entomology course. So I've taken it upon myself as sort of a personal crusade to try to stir up more interest and to try to get people connected with, with the insect world around them. So I teach entomology on a regular basis and get my students out there getting their hands on insects and trying to figure out what they are. Um, students in my lab and I have, have worked on, on developing resources to make insect diversity more accessible to those students. And, and so here are some students who worked in my lab with me on developing this, this Pacific Northwest Moths website that features about 1,200 moth species um, in super high def um, photos that, that really are, are pretty jaw-dropping when you zoom in and can see the individual scales on the wings. Um, so this is just an example of one of the plates from, from, that, uh, from that website. And then much of my time, as I said, over the last decade is involved working on this book. And, and so what I wanted the, the field guide to be was something that was, that captured what's amazing about insect diversity that made it possible for people to identify insects with confidence and that was tailored to the region. Because most of the, of the well-produced insect field guides that are for general insect identification try to handle all of North America, which is just crazy. I mean, there's so many insects in North America that you end up having large numbers of, of the species in these field guides not apply to whatever region you are in. And so I wanted a, a guide that would actually apply to the insects of our area. And so the, the, the project was also one that was, I don't know, part of a, a personal career arc process for me in that I had kind of gotten more and more reductionist in my science and I was doing lab work and you know, doing a bunch of genetic analyses of populations of hybridizing beetles to understand the evolution of, of barriers between species, really esoteric kinds of stuff. Um, and I was finding that I was, I was not feeling the jazz as much as I, as I used to. Or, and I was starting to think, well, why did I get into biology in the first place? And, and I sort of had these aha moments of, it's because I really, really like insect diversity and I want to be able to roll around in insect diversity as much as I can gleefully like a, you know, like a puppy in fresh mown grass. Um, and so I used this book as an opportunity to go exploring with camera in hand. And the Pacific Northwest is a wonder, wonderful, wonderful place to do this kind of exploring because we have a rich array of different kinds of habitats thanks to mountains and patterns of rainfall and, 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 and so on. So we've got uh, rainforests on the wet side of the Olympics. And then if you go down to Southeast Oregon here, we've got these sagebrush deserts and all sorts of different kinds of things in between, each of which harbors its own unique assemblages of, of insects. And so um, I, I went around and took tons of pictures. Um, thank you to whoever it was that invented digital SLRs because um, I could not have afforded the amount of film it would have taken to, to do all of this photography. Um, digital SLRs really make people much better macro photographers because you get that instant feedback. 
So I, I also went around with net in hand looking for things. Um, and then I spent a lot of time at the region's major insect collections. So at Oregon State University, Washington State University, University of Idaho, um, University of British Columbia. Those are the, really the, the major ones in the region. Uh, so, uh, um, and then also the Royal British Columbia Museum. Um, and at these museums, I wanted to gather data that I could then use to make informed species accounts in the guide. So this is really where the scholarly research aspect of, of this project kind of comes in. So what I would do at a, at a museum is um, I, would, I had a particular focal species that I wanted to ga gather information about. I would look at all of the holdings of specimens in that collection and look at every blasted label under each specimen and try to get a sense of what's the range of months over which these specimens were sampled and have they been found in Northeast Oregon? Have they been found in Southeast Oregon? Have they been found in Northern Idaho? And, and I went to all the different collections gleaning all of these data from all of these specimens, hundreds of thousands of specimens by the time all was said and done. Um, and, and, and so that I could then write an account that actually made sense for the Northwest because, as I said, with these national field guides, it might say that the species is active from March to November, but that's because it's down in Florida as well as up here and the growing season is so much longer down there. It's ne you're never going to find it in March up here. So this is an example of what the, what the accounts look like. Um, and this is a zoomed in look at that text because I know there's no way you could read the fine print. Um, so basically the idea here is I try to um, give a description that's thorough enough to have the defining features of, of the species as well as diagnostic features for how you tell it apart from the similar species with which you might confuse it. Uh, so that similar species section is down here describing how these other species might differ. So that way, if somebody gets, finds a beetle like this, they don't just assume it's that one, which is what you do with your, your typical insect field guide, but you can actually look, are there similar species? And if so, how do I tell them apart? So all told, the book features about 1,200 insects um, as, as accounts. But if you ask, well, how many species are mentioned, including these similar species, it's more than 3,000 insect species that are, are somehow discussed in the book. So the book features all sorts of different kinds of insects, and I just wanted to give you a, a sort of a sampling of, of some of the cool things that, that you, you can find in its pages. This particular moth is one that has kind of a, a nice story to it in that that specimen I photographed in my backyard and it turns out that that was the first time anybody had ever seen this species alive in North America and, and at least knew that it was something of, of note. There had been a few specimens uh, collected in sticky traps in, around, around the port of Seattle, around Vancouver, around Tacoma. People had no idea what it was. Um, it turns out it's a European moth that had gotten here somehow. Um, but it's, it's got an interesting life history in that the larvae feed under loose bark on fungi, our malaria fungi, and this, this particular moth has actually declined so much in large parts of its native range in Europe uh, that it's on many lists of, of conservation concern. And, and the reason why it's, it's presumably the reason why it's declined so much there is that in lots of, lots of European countries, there's this practice of cleaning up the forest floor. So you walk around through a forest and it's very tidy. Uh, dead limbs aren't just left to lie rotting there. And so you, the loose bark and the armillaria fungi are taken away that these guys would normally feed on. So it got here somehow and it's thriving from Vancouver all the way down to Tacoma. Uh, so several of us wrote up a paper on, on this kind of unique story. This is a garden tiger moth, just one of many absolutely lovely moths, uh, dis totally dispelling the notion that moths are ugly and butterflies are beautiful. There are also lots of really ugly butterflies, um, so, so get that out of your head if you think that's a, a true dichotomy, it's not. This is a lace bug. Um, lace bugs are, are tiny, tiny little insects that um, have this intricate pattern of sculpturing. To me, they look sort of like living doilies. 
Um, and, and just to give you a sense of, of scale here, these are pollen grains. There's one sitting on its, on its wing. So this is a very, very small insect. Uh, this was on arrowleaf balsam root over in eastern Washington. But it just gives you an idea of, if, of the beauty that you can encounter if you just stop and take a closer look. This is a golden tortoise beetle. So these you might find in your, in your garden here. They feed on morning glory. And one of the neat things about these golden tortoise beetles is that they can actually change their color based on how hydrated the spaces are between the layers in their exoskeleton. So they, they can either be this, this molten golden color or they can be more of an orange with dark spots on them. Uh, and for a, as a kid, I was fascinated with, with that switching and, and really was hoping I could try to figure out a way to have specimens that were gold, but I never, never figured out a way. This is an ice crawler. Um, this is a rather obscure group of insects that is kind of a Pacific Northwest specialty. Um, they're, for most people, they're probably not much to look at, um, maybe a little bit too reminiscent of an earwig. Um, but they're actually pretty amazing insects. So uh, here and Eastern Asia are the global centers of diversity for, for ice crawlers. And they are so attuned to living at cold temperatures that if you hold them in your hand, the heat of your hand will kill them. Uh, so, so all of their metabolic enzymes are set to work at near freezing temperatures, but not at what we consider to be hospitable temperatures. And they crawl around on the surface of the snow and, and forage on insects that, that fall out of the sky and get trapped on the snow surface and can't leave because, well, they don't have those metabolic enzymes and so they're pretty much sunk once they cool down too much. Here we have a pair of insects. On the top here is a robber fly and down here we have a bumblebee. So robber flies are voracious predators that uh, stake out a perch so they'll sit on something like this microphone or a twig uh, waiting for other insects to fly by and then they chase after them and, and they've got this needle-like mouth that they then use to inject their prey with a toxin that pretty much instantly disables the prey. And so they, they dispatch them in midair, uh, haul them off to a place, and then use that same needle-like mouth to suck out the body fluids of their prey. So it's like, you know, space age kind of dramas that, 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 that can play out right before your very eyes. This is an ant species that lives in the mountains around here. It's called an Amazon ant. And Amazon ants are legendary among entomologists in that they have a, a ruthless behavior of taking slaves. So the way that Amazon ants work is that uh, this is a, 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 an Amazon ant right here. They will find colonies of other ant species and invade those colonies and haul off the pupae of those other ants, bring them back to the Amazon ant colony, and then when those ants emerge as adult ants, they basically imprint on the Amazon ant colony and act as workers for the Amazon ant colony. They're none the wiser, but you know, it's, it's pretty, vi pretty vicious stuff. What we have here is kind of an ensemble of insects that aren't necessarily what they look to be at first. So what we have in the upper left is something that looks very much like a yellow jacket, but it's actually a moth. Down here we have something that looks very much like an ant, but it's actually a plant bug, more closely related to that lace bug that I showed you than, than to ants. Up here we have a beetle, but this beetle looks actually a lot like a caterpillar dropping. And in fact, if you disturb the plant, the beetle will fold up its legs into little grooves, pull its antennae into little grooves, drop to the ground, and just be sitting on the ground looking all the world like another caterpillar dropping on the ground, which is a great strategy if you want to avoid being eaten, unless you're being chased by the, you know, the angry caterpillar dropping eater, uh, which probably would have left you alone had you looked like a beetle. <clears throat> There's no such thing as the angry caterpillar dropping. <laughs> Just want to make sure I don't spread misinformation. Down here we have um, what, what looks a lot like a bumblebee, but is actually a flower fly. Uh, these are, are those kinds of flies that you'll often find hovering in, in front of flowers. 
Many of them look more like yellow jackets, um, but, but this particular one looks a lot like a bumblebee. And you can hold them in your hands. They're totally harmless. They'll buzz like crazy. They'll really do their best to try to make you, make you think that they are indeed bumblebees. Uh, but if you look at them up close, you'll see that they don't have the typical elbowed bee antennae. They don't have the, um, the, the set of hind wings that a bee has. Instead, they have the little peg-like structures back there. So, so there's some pretty, pretty, uh, pretty big differences once you start to, to know what to look for. The book also extends beyond insects to other creepy crawlies that people wonder about who also wonder about insects. So we've got spiders like this jumping spider with this beautiful red abdomen. Jumping spiders are awesome spiders. Um, they have these great behaviors where they use their front legs as semaphores to do male-male um, posturing and also to attract mates. So you can sometimes find a couple males faced off doing this sort of stuff like, I'm better than you, and eventually one of them gives up. Um, so. If you ever run into jumping spiders, they're really fun to watch for that. And also, they've got these giant headlamp-like front eyes. Um, they're very, very visual. And if, you, if there's one sitting here and you kind of walk around, they'll actually turn and look at you. So, so they're, uh, they're very charismatic as spiders go. We have scorpions. This is a scorpion from eastern Washington. There are also some scorpions that get into southwest Washington. And then down south and in Idaho, there are, are more scorpion species. These things are, are unless you were allergic, are, are really not dangerous. They're, it'd be kind of like a bee sting if you got stung by them. So ultimately, in introducing people to all of these kinds of, of insects and, and other arthropods, I'm hoping to enable people to become better connected with a natural, a part of the natural world around them that is actually readily accessible. It's very easy to go out into your yard and start to study the insects that are in your yard. And you'll find that the, the possibilities are actually limitless. You could spend many, many, many years just studying the insect species of your yard and still not know what they all are. Um, I, would, I would estimate that there are easily a few thousand species of, of, of insects that would come through a typical Bellingham yard over the course of a decade, um, and many of them would be pretty frequent. Um, you'd have to look in the soil, and you, know, you might need to put out a dead mouse or something like that every now and then to find the carrion feeders, but you know, the, there are lots of things you can do with, with insects. And, and I'm hoping that the... <laughs> in insects, but will also lead to an increased uh, connection between citizen scientists and insects. Because citizen science is a, a really growing movement in this country and in other countries. People have all sorts of abilities now to geotag photos that they take and can make meaningful contributions to a lot of different studies that are looking at changes in the distribution of organisms in space and time. And, and there are many, many citizen science initiatives that have been established to take advantage of this massive army of, of volunteer workers. So whether we're talking about Cal Flora or Oak Mapper or Project Bud Burst, all plant-related things, or whether we're looking at, at insect-focused uh, citizen science projects like Butterflies and Moths of North America or, or Bug Guide down here in the lower right, or some all-purpose ones like iNaturalist. These are all excellent places to, to submit data and, and, and make a real contribution to th that either you or others can use to, to build a better picture of what's happening in the natural world. Because one of the things that I think was most shocking to a lot of people was that you could have these kinds of big declines in insects that I talked about in Germany and in Puerto Rico and it was as though that happened out of nowhere. And the reason why is because nobody was looking. People just don't do the long-term kinds of studies. And if we, have, if we have a world of naturalists out there keeping track and checking in on the natural world around them, we won't miss it when things like that happen again. So at the end of the day, as I said at the outset, I'm somebody who just has it in me. I'm never going to lose my love for insects. I'm hoping that the book helps 
as many people as possible fall in love with insects the way I did when I was, you know, probably in the womb. Um, and I'm also hoping that, that this love can result in a change in how we interact with the natural world. And so I'll close with this quote from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I think that, that, that if we can get people excited about insects enough to start to scream from the mountaintops that we need to, to do things to protect them, the world will be a much better place.